my name is Claire Smith. I'm currently a junior at Mountain View High School, and I'm currently the president of competition of our team. So I deal with logistics and making sure that we're prepared for every competition, including off season and this coming on season. However, last season I was our uh, robotics team strategy lead, so I dealt with making sure that we were completely prepared for every match and that everything was planned out. So during this talk, I will go through how we make sure that we are prepared for and prepared to execute every single match to the best of our ability and the best of our alliance ability. And this includes preparations before and during a competition. I'll also go through our SFR story and how we were able to win San Francisco Regional, which was our first regional, with only two robots playing on the field during eliminations, and how we came to make this decision because it was a very tough decision. And I'll also discuss our team philosophy involving competitions and strategy in general, and how we want to improve on this moving forward and continuing in the future. So moving on to pre-competition, I want to first discuss our priority list. So on the day of kickoff, we begin having strategy meetings. We don't just wait until competitions. We begin discussing strategy the day of kickoff. And we begin field mapping. So we'll draw out a map of the field on a really big piece of paper. And this year, we took little toy cars. And we started drawing paths of the field and potential paths that we as a robot could take. So as you can see, we're doing this right here. I'm driving a little robot cart around. And we drew different paths from different human player stations to different areas of the grid where we could potentially score. And we also ran two alliances at the same time in this simulation so we could see which areas of the field we thought would be most crowded, where we might get congestion, where we thought defense would occur, if defense would occur, where you could defend someone. In addition, we created a priority list of action items that we want to complete in game. And we kind of based our robot design off of this off of where we want to score and what game pieces we want to focus on. So for example, in this priority list here, you can see that we prioritize first basic functions such as moving around the field, driving, scoring, passing inspection, or not scoring yet, driving, passing inspection, remaining intact, not having your bumpers fall off or anything, as well as uh, docking and engaging on the charging station, especially during auto because of the high, high point value assigned to this action. And then after that, we generally prioritize being able to score cones in the top row. And you can see this reflection in our robot. We also prioritize being able to pick up cones from the double human player station, which is what we generally did. We always picked up cones from the human player station. We very rarely got them off the ground because they weren't fallen there and we didn't pick them up from the single. So this translated into our game strategy and into our game design. And it's really important to have this in mind when you're creating a robot. So continuing on we engaged in strategy calls. We're very lucky to be a part of different groups and in collaboration with different teams nationally and internationally. And starting from the week after kickoff, we were able to discuss in online calls with different teams about our priority list and compare these action items. It's very important to know that you're not alone in this and that you're not doing anything unreasonable and to be able to see that other people may have similar ideas to you or different ones that you can learn from or if you want to remain different from them. We also discussed um, what an ideal match might look like and what the ideal perfect auto is. And we learned a lot from this. Um, we discussed different paths that a robot could take and we kind of translated this into our auto design. Our auto, which um, was one of the first, if not the first robot in RFRC to be able to score three game pieces and dock and engage at our first competition, SFR, was heavily inspired by these calls and we definitely learned a lot from them. Lastly, before we go to com competitions, we do something called pre-scouting, which we can't go, uh, we can't do before our first competition, SFR, but we're actually in the midst of this for Chessy Champs, which is two weeks away. And pre-scouting helps us learn a lot about the competition before we actually go to compete there. It helps us learn about how we compare to the other robots at the competition and how we're expected to perform. It informs our strategic decisions and planning early on in the competition. It's very, very important to us that we never go into a single match blind. It doesn't matter if it's our first one or our last one. We are making a plan with our alliance members for every single match. So we pre-scout, um, and this involves data scouts or anyone on the team, including mentors. It's a very fun activity for our team. They go into a scout claim, and they claim as many robots as they want, and they go into the Blue Alliance, and they watch the three most recent elimination matches and the three most recent qualification matches of the robot that they chose. 
and they input this data into our scouting app, which goes into Tableau, which I'll be talking about momentarily. And this helps us plan these matches and make informed decision, decisions based on this data. It's also a really great opportunity to practice data scouting skills for data scouts, um, as they're able to familiarize themselves with the scouting app and Tableau and the robots that are going to be at the competition before we go. It's also just a great team bonding exercise. We have a lot of fun with it. It becomes a competition to see who can scout the most robots and earn prizes. It's just a really fun experience. So moving on to our strategy at competition, I'll be going through our strategy team breakdown, Tableau, strategy runs and sheets, and our pick list meetings, which all inform very impart important parts of how we play in a competition in, as a whole. So first, a strategy team is made up of one strategy lead. That was my job last season. It'll be a different person this season. But the job of the strategy lead is to complete strategy runs, which I'll explain very shortly. But basically, this person is going to other teams using data from our data analyst team. And they are discussing with these other teams. They're figuring out exactly what's going to happen in the match and when. And we're just creating an entire plan for the match. And uh, this is informed by and helped by our strategy mentor, who generally provides guidance. They'll go on some of the difficult match runs, not necessarily all of them, but they definitely help a lot with communicating with other teams and just making sure that we're all on the same page across our own team as well. Lastly, in strategy team, we have three data analysts, and the job of the data analyst is to go through note scouting and data scouting data on our platform called Tableau, which I'll discuss on the next slides and they input this data into a strategy sheet and make sure that we have all the information, the strategy lead has all the information needed to make informed decisions. And generally, one of these data analysts is also historically, it's a separate role, but historically one of them has also been a strategic match recorder who takes a close-up video of our robot during a match and then does a match debrief with our drive team to make sure that we're continually improving and looking at what we as a team and what can we as a robot do better in the future, how can we improve our actions, not necessarily the strategy of other teams, but how can we as a team improve? So moving on, we use a software called Tableau, which is a website or an app that you can get on your phone or any computer. And it allows us to visually display data and note scouting data through certain graphics and certain pie charts and things like that. And it allows us to present the results of matches and compare ourselves and other teams at a competition it's very important, uh, and we use this to inform a ton of our strategic decisions. So I'll be going through some of the different dashboards we have. And this definitely looks a little bit intimidating. There's so much data up here, and it definitely did take a long time to make. I you know, put a lot into Tableau, but um, this is main dashboard. And this is generally used during our pick list meetings. It provides kind of an overview of all the teams at a competition. It provides mostly graphics of averages. As you can see, we have average teleop points, match score over time, average teleop game pieces, average auto charging points, etc. And an important feature with Main Dash is that we can sort in this sort parameter, if you can see, by different criteria, such as average teleop points, ranking, which we input from the Blue Alliance, and it will sort these graphics from lowest to highest, and we can compare the different teams and how they're looking. Moving on, we have Match Dash, which is my personal favorite. This is used for individual match strategy. So you can sort by a match number, and it breaks up the graphic by team number. So as you can see, we have average alliance links scored by each team in this match. And, and it also includes uh, uh, graphics on game pieces scored. But then it also has graphics that combine these for the entire alliance. So you can kind of predict what will happen in a match. And if it's a hard match, this is what we use to determine which are our difficult matches so we can spend the most time and energy on these matches. It helps us compare points, links, strengths, and weaknesses of all the different uh, teams competing in a match. So lastly, we have Team Dash, which is used for an in-depth analysis of one specific team. For example, if we want to look at ourselves up here, we can see over time uh, how much we scored in every match in the breakdown of auto, and end game, tally up, and uh, charging points. And then also our success rates for charging through these pie charts. And it helps us during pick list meetings if we really want to go in depth in a robot or if we want to see what an outlier may be. For example, if their average is really low but we have noticed that they're a very high scoring and high performing team, we can look and see 
oh, they got zero points for this match. Something must be off and we can investigate. Moving on, we use Tableau for strategy runs, which is the main job of the strategy lead and the main goal of the strategy team, if that makes sense. So as strategy lead, I dedicated a lot of time to this. A big point on our team is that these strategy runs are never completed by drive team. Our drive team never learns the entire strategy of a match. They're completed by the strategy team, the strategy lead mostly, who in the future we're working on bringing in some of the data analysts to help on these runs as well. So in these strategy runs, we plan out the entire match with both Alliance members. We meet with both of them. Generally, we take um, a member of the data analyst team or the strategy mentor. But a big focus on our team is minimizing the amount of people at a time that are interacting with other teams so that we're not overwhelming them. We don't want six people going into one pit and overwhelming it. We generally have two or three going on these runs. And we figure out everything in a match. We uh, use our strategy sheets, which I'll show in a moment, to plan out the exact auto path that we'll be running, where everyone's starting, what game pieces they're scoring, who's going to balance, and when. The exact teleop pathing and placing. So we plan out where every single game piece is being scored. We plan out who's scoring it on which grid, and if we have to flip sides of the grid for some reason because of scoring capabilities, etc. We plan that all out during our talks. We also plan out exactly when and who is going to balance, who's in charge of it, what drive coach can make the call. And I know this is pretty common for uh, most teams. And then this plan is then forwarded to our ACE team. And this team is uh, responsible for making sure that our Alliance members are in good condition. So they'll go talk to them, they'll encourage them to run a functional, they'll provide any resources or assistance that they may need in that moment. Um, just giving ourselves uh, giving ourselves up as a resource if our Alliance members may need help for anything, and um, they offer any assistance that they may have needed. So strategy sheets, I know they're pretty common as well. Um, most teams have these two graphics, one for auto, one for teleop, and endgame uh, pathing. So we map out the entire pathing of a match with our, both our, our Alliance members. However, something that's a bit unique about our team is that on the other side, we have a, um, two data tables, there's also one above it for the blue lines, I just wanted to zoom in more, where we have sections for auto, teleop, endgame, and notes, and then different categories within these. So our data analyst team will go through pit, pit scouting, data scouting, and note scouting to fill out these tables with the necessary information. So they'll not only input the point averages, they'll input their capabilities, like they generally score high and mid, this is a fake team, team number zero, but They'll take notes on they can be pinned easily by defense when coming out of their loading zone. Or they may be good at avoiding their alliance members in the community. And they'll write down their auto options. And this is given to the strategy lead who then takes this data into account and these notes into account. We don't just want to look at the data from Tableau. It's important to us that we're looking at the whole picture of the alliance. For example, let's say we are playing defense on a team and one of the opposing teams scores five points average higher than another during teleop, but we have noticed that they are very decisive and strong, quick driving, and they are never affected by defense. However, another team may score five points less than them on average during teleop, but we have noticed that they can easily be pinned by defense and that they're easily hindered. We'd likely choose to put a defense bot on this lower scoring bot because we think overall it would have a higher impact. So this sheet is very important to us to make sure that we have this information and that the, we can make completely informed decisions. And then this sheet is given to drive coach generally 30 minutes or earlier before a match, and the drive coach, Austin, then decides what information is going to our drive team. So the entire match plan, what the other alliance is thinking or doing, is not given to our drive team. We do not want them during a match to be thinking, oh, I need to look at the other team. Are they playing defense? What's happening to them? How many game pieces have they scored? We need to catch up. We just want them to focus on playing the absolute best that our robot possibly can in every single match, regardless of what other teams are doing. So it's my job to enable them, or it's the strategy lead's job to enable them to do that. Moving on, we have pick list meetings, which I know a lot of teams do, but we structure ours in an interesting way based on Tableau. So these generally take place after the last full day of qualification matches before elimination matches begin. So for example, for Chessie Champs coming up, this is gonna be Saturday night. It's normally Saturday night, but it can depend. These meetings com are composed of a group of strategy, strike team, or ace team, and scouting students, plus members who do work to create rank lists. Generally, there's one for offense and one for defense, depending if we are in a picking position or not. 
But generally, even if we're not in a picking position, we'll make these two lists anyways, because you never know what can happen in the next half day of qualification matches, because generally there is one half day on Sunday. And these meetings allow us to easily just run down the pick list during match selection. We don't want to be looking back at our notes on the field, stressing, trying to think about it too much. We just want to be able to go straight down the list and make informed decisions based on these meetings. So during these meetings, we first determine some of the qualities we need in Alliance members. For example, in an offensive pick, we need someone with a compatible auto to us. This past season, we generally ran our three game piece dock and engage auto on the flat side, so we need someone who would have a compatible auto on the bump side. We also look for someone generally who has strong defense, uh, strong avoiding defense skills, strong driving, quick decisive movement, and is fast at lining up and scoring, and just in general is good at collaborating with others. In a defensive pick, a lot of the time, we don't look for robots that have actually been playing defense, because that can be pretty rare, especially during qualification matches. We'll look at the driving capabilities of the robots. So, if, for example, if we see a robot that's really good at avoiding defense, and really good at escaping defense and avoiding their teammates, we can infer that they have quick, nimble driving, and they would be able to stick onto someone well if they are playing defense. We then input a ranked list based on a criterion from Tableau. For example, we can look and sort all the teams in the competition based on average tally op score, and we'll copy and paste or input this list into a Google Sheet. Then we'll go through and do something called bubble sorting. So we add a bunch of notes. Um, this meeting could take a very long time. We're working on shortening it, but it can often take multiple hours. And we'll rewatch a ton of match videos. We'll add in notes and data scouting data. We'll write down their auto options, their driving capabilities, etc. And then we bubble sort the list. So we'll compare the first and second teams that we have ranked, and we'll say, are we happy with this? Do we want to bump to above one? If not, we move down to two and three. We may see that three scores, on average, two less points during teleop. However, they have a way more compatible auto, so we bump three above two. And you continue going down the list, then you go back up until you're happy with it. And then we copy and paste this list of just the raw team numbers into a separate sheet on the uh, document. And then during match selection, it's very easy for our field representative, who last year was Taya, to just run through it, and people in the stands would highlight red the teams that had been chosen, and we would just easily say the next team on the list. No stress. <laughs> <laughs> Only a little stress. <laughs> Moving on, we have our SFR story. So San Francisco Regional was our first competition of the season, and it was a very big learning point for us as a team. We grew a lot from it. We tried out different strategies. So I'll just give some context for SFR Regional. We got invited, so going into match selection, we were on the second ranked alliance. We got invited to join the first alliance, and this is something that we take very seriously. We considered the night before possible um, outcomes of this, and we decided that we would like to decline that offer, and we formed our own second alliance with 972, who's here. Very exciting. <laughs> and Team 8016. So some of the reasons we chose 972, just based on our, of our pick list, was they had a compatible auto to us that could run on the bump side and was very successful. Um, they could use the single human player station and pick up cones from the ground, which was very beneficial to us as we use only the double because we can automate it with our vision. So we would be able to stay out of each other's way, basically, very, very well, and just not interfere with each other very much while we were getting game pieces and while we were scoring them. Um, they all also had generally quick and smart driving and movement, and in general we just had a good experience working with them. We were paired up in one of the last qualification matches together, and we had a good time working with their strategy, and we were just very compatible teams, so we decided to choose them. And 8016 was our third bot, who was generally a defense bot. However, things took a turn for the worst. During um, our third elimination match, during semifinals, 8016 broke down due to some electrical issues, and they were stuck where they were started in auto. So they were starting in the middle position, right in front of the co-op grid, if you know where that is on a field, and they were not able to move from that position for the entire match. They could not drive properly, they could not get out of the community. So as a result of that, we were just not able to score. So um, we lost this match, and this was a very, very stressful time for us because we were then in the lower bracket, and we had members of uh, ACE team, then strike team, in their pit working with them, trying to get their robot fixed. However, it would just take multiple hours to fix their robot and they were not going to be ready to be on the field. So if you don't know how backup robots work, after match selection, 
uh, a list gets generated of backup robots and they can either opt to be on or off the list. And you can only choose the first robot on that list. You don't get a selection of all of them. So the only backup robot that we could choose was also not functioning. So we had our ACE team in their pit working with them, trying to get it functioning, but it was just not going to work out. So we had come to a very tough decision. And this decision was made on our team. It was not taken lightly at all with several mentors, several students, including our strategy lead, our strategy mentor, our drive coach. And it was made in combination with 972 and 8016, of course. We made this all together. It was a very hard decision because we were in the lower bracket and we didn't know if we could win our next match with only two robots because the uh, data showed that it was so close. However, we decided as an entire alliance that this was the least risky decision because we simply could not risk having a robot in the community zone who would not be able to move again. We had to be able to score at our highest capability in order to have any chance of winning. So we made the tough decision and we decided to go into the last three elimination matches with only two robots on the field. And 8016 was just very gracious during this entire thing. They were encouraging us. They made this decision a little bit easier and it was just a great experience. And another reason we decided that we didn't want to take the risk of swapping out 8016 with the backup robot was because we had a really good experience working with 8016's human player who manned the other half of the double uh, st substation and they were very skilled at effectively putting out cones in the specific way we needed to be able to pick them up. So it just worked really well to keep them on the field and we did not take their human player out. They continued playing through the rest of the competition. So moving into our next match, our last semifinals match before finals against the third ranked alliance was the closest match we played in this entire competition. It was very tight, it was a very, very hard match. Um, and we had to strategize well for this. So just going down a little breakdown of the strategy, we determined that because our data showed that the match was so close, it was within a couple points of itself, that the other team would not be playing any defense at all, and we just could not worry about defense because we only had two robots. So our only option was to play double offense. And so we came up with a strategy where 971 would fill up the top half, the top row of the co-op grid, while 972 took the left grid in front of their driver station. Then we would swap cycles, and 972 would fill up the mid and the rest of the co-op grid while we took the right side of the grid. And this worked really smoothly. We just had a great time offsetting our cycle times. We never interacted. That's kind of our philosophy. We never want to interact with our aligned members during a match on the field. We want to be communicating, but we never want to be butting heads. We never want to be seeing each other or getting in each other's way or waiting for each other in any capacity. So this just worked really well. The field was not clogged for us at all because the other alliance was only playing offense, of course. And so um, 972 managed to fill up the co-op grid and we managed to fill up our side of the grid and it worked very well. This was a very stressful match. I was out of my seat pacing. I could not watch. It was so bad. But we won this match by one point. It was 146 to 145 and it was insane. It was so stressful, but it was lovely. And we managed to win our next two uh, finals matches and we won the entire competition. And that was a great experience. It was definitely a stressful time for our team, but looking back on it, I think it was a really big opportunity for growth. I definitely learned a lot about strategy from 972 and just from everyone at the competition. For example, planning out where every single game piece was, we were kind of vaguely doing that before, but we really got into it after SFR. We were planning things way more in depth, learning more about how we could swap cycles and work better with our alliance members. And just in general, we learned a lot about trusting our data and trusting our notes on when we need to make risky decisions. Because choosing to play with two robots was very difficult, but based on our data and based on our notes, we knew that this was the best decision to make, and it worked out. So we knew to trust these decisions in the future and to follow them to the best of our abilities. So moving forward, and just wrapping up a little bit early, um, our strategic philosophy. This is something that we're working on improving on in the future, and I just want to discuss two pieces of media that as a team and as a leadership team, we've definitely learned a lot from recently. And our team philosophy and our competitive philosophy is something that we're trying to grow a lot in moving forward. So first we have The Score Takes Care of Itself. This is a book about Bill Walsh, who was the former coach of the San Francisco 49ers. And before he uh, came into position here, they were not a very good team. They were kind of a mess. And he led them to the Super Bowl multiple times and to winning the Super Bowl through his leadership and through his competitive philosophies. 
So we, as a leadership team, read this book and we reflected on it a lot, especially in terms of strategy, for me at least. And it definitely taught us a lot. And so I'll go over some of the points that we've learned. Emphasis on each individual match is essential. Sometimes it's easy to kind of over-optimize the entire competition. For example, in one match, think, oh, if I do this one thing, if I score game pieces in this certain pattern, it'll, it'll interest this other team who scores game pieces in a complementing way, and they might choose us. But you just can't confirm that. There's no way to guarantee what other teams will do. You can only guarantee what you can do, and it's essential for us to work towards performing the best that we can as a team in every single individual match. So to do this, we set a standard of performance. And this is something that we've gotten away from a little bit, but we're trying to move forward and come back to in the future. So this is referenced in the book as being a standard that regardless of what other teams do, regardless of how others perform, you can be proud of yourself and you can aim for it in every single match. Sometimes matches are just very difficult and other teams are very overpowering. And of course you can try to optimize with defense, but at the end of the day, there are some matches that are very hard to win. And you just have to, once you lose, learn how can I do better. And reflect on, did I meet my standard of performance? For us, that standard of performance is scoring at least two ranking points in every single match. Even if we don't win the match, we need to be scoring those two ranking points to gu guarantee ourselves something. If you try a crazy, over-optimized strategy to just try to reach for that win, even though you think it may not work, you could risk losing those those two ranking points, and then you have zero. And then we did not meet our standard of performance. We also focus a lot on individual accountability and student leadership. So um, we encourage our students to lead others. And if you went to Taya's talk earlier, you know that at a competition, every sub-team is assigned a leader. And they work to lead and provide guidance to those in their subsystem or in their subsection. For example, on strategy, the strategy lead is responsible for taking the data analyst team on strategy runs and teaching them how to communicate with other teams, how to collaborate. Um, during match review videos or uh, de match debriefs with our drive team, our strategic analyst, our strategic match recorder, as well as mentors are encouraged and empowered to provide guidance and provide feedback to our drive team. As we always want to be growing and never sitting still, we always want to focus on how can we do better? How can we get that extra game piece? How can we get that extra point? How can we perform that cycle in a faster time? We also focus on taking wins and losses both very humbly. It's easy when you win to get cocky and to think, oh, I did so great in this match. I'll do great in the next one, but that's not the case at all. This is reflected in our driver debriefs. It's essential every single time to go into that debrief and to look at how can we improve? How can we make that cycle two seconds shorter? How can we avoid that defense? Because there are always things that you can do better. Even in the SFR finals, we should be going back. We should be watching that match and learning what to do better. And taking losses, it's essential that we don't just let it get us down, that we don't just let it depress us. We have to reflect on, did we meet our standard of performance? Did we score two ranking points? If we did, that's still a celebration in and of itself we can still reflect on, was it possible to win the match? What mistakes did we make? If we didn't meet that standard of performance, we really need to think about what can we do in the future to guarantee that we do, because that's not acceptable. That's the point of the standard of performance. You need to be getting two ranking points in every match that you physically possibly can. Moving on, we have the movie Miracle, which we recently watched as a team bonding movie night uh, activity, which was very fun. But it also teaches us a lot of important lessons. So it's about the USA um, national hockey team that went to the Olympics, and they managed to win against the Soviets. And a big point of this movie was that no individual player on this team was better than the Soviet players. None of them were amazing. None of them were jaw-dropping. They were all solid, but none of them were perfect. But working together and constantly drilling and constantly conditioning led them to be able to win because they were able to outskate the Soviets and because they were able to work together and use this to psych them out. So on our team, we believe that just having a fancy, having a very well-designed, um, capable robot is important, but it's not enough to win any competition. It's not enough to win a single match. If you're not communicating with your alliance, if you're not scouting, if you don't have hard data, you're not gonna be able to work well. You're gonna be butting heads, you're gonna be fighting for who charges first, and it just won't work. So this is my strategy in scouting and 
ACE team and pit crew are all essential parts. Every single person on our team is an essential piece of the puzzle that leads us to do well. So this movie taught us a lot also about optimizing our alliance and our team members. Every single match is an opportunity to learn and to grow and to make the most out of your team. That's why we have ACE team. That's why we ensure that every robot going onto the field, this is something we're working on too in the future and doing better in these points, is functional and is going to be able to perform to the best capability that they can. We also focus on continuous training, improvement, and practice. In the movie, there's a famous saying, again, and they run hundreds and hundreds of sprints across the ice, and all the players are exhausted, and Sarah, Sarah knows this well. This is what she's like at drive practice. We run so many matches, but it's essential to making sure that we're prepared <laughs> at a competition. We need to make sure that we have that muscle memory in our drive team. That's why we host drive practice. <laughs> and um, it's very, very important that we're always looking for room to grow and we're always working. That's why we do drive practice. That's why we do drive review videos. And we look for what specific points, when we nitpick the entire match, which we do, what specific points, what specific game pieces can we handle better? How can we perform better? How can we do well? And yeah, Miracle definitely taught us a lot, as well as the score takes care of itself. And just in conclusion, before I get to questions a little bit early, so you might get off a bit early, but on our team, strategy is more than just having a talk, filling out a sheet with the other team. It's about collaboration. It's about optimizing every single aspect of a match that we possibly can. A lot more goes into it than most people on even our team realize. The data analyst team, who are working through all the note scouting and data scouting data, who these scouts also put in a lot of effort, they're compiling this data so we can make informed decisions. Our ACE team, who's going around and ensuring that our alliance members have the assistance they need and that they're functional. Our drive coach, who goes through the matches and decides what information the drive team needs to know. It all comes together to create an informed, complete strategy that we need to be able to accomplish a match. It's not just about the robot, it's about the team, it's about executing as a whole. Thank you very much. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Um, what like strategy do you have for like picking events if you do have a strategy? Like for like picking competitions with you? Yeah, Sarah, we do or you go. Sure, I can introduce it. Sarah's also here to help answer questions. She's our competition mentor. Um, so a lot of it is about timing based on when we think we can complete the robot by and it, spacing them out so we have time to practice and improve our robot in between competitions. It's also about proximity to us, but if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, that, that covers it. Yeah. So we went to San Francisco and we went to Monterey Bay. They're both pretty close by. We don't generally go super far for regionals. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah? So how does drive training factor into your defense assignments as well as your speed? As well as speed? So this was definitely seen a lot less this year. There was not a lot of defense. At SFR, there was some defense, but once you got up to champs especially, there was almost no defense being played. It was mostly triple offense because defense is harder with these protected zones. But we definitely optimize, and I know that we are a tank drive, but when we're doing strategic planning on defense, you'll put a, you'll put a defense spot on a tank drive because they're more easily defendable. And generally, even if we're not just looking at drive frame type, we want to look at the driving capabilities. So if a swerve drive is very fast and they're able to be pinned, and they're able to pin other robots, then that's great, we'll put them on defense. But if we have notes that a swerve drive is very light and they may be tippy, we may not put them on defense. We might put a strong tank that's able to sit in a zone and block it. Because even if they're not going to be as nimble as the swerve, they might be able to have a bigger impact if they're able to just block a section. And that's something we did this year. We just had robots sitting outside of part of the community just clogging up the flow. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, did you guys use pit scouting to gather data on the teams? Yes, we did. Um, we were really gathering data. We already knew a lot generally from um, pre-scouting. And um, like Sarah mentioned earlier in Taya's presentation, if you went there, every team is going to say that they can score perfect five lengths and that they're the best performing team at the competition. And our data scout data and our note scouting will tell us if they're telling the truth and they'll tell us what their capabilities actually are. But we get a lot of characteristics and qualities of robots from pit scouting. And part of that does go into strategy sheets. For example, where can they score? Like physically, where can they score? What are their auto options? What's their weight? What's their dimensions? Mostly for uh, charging aspects, when we're figuring out alliances for elimination matches, we look at like dimensions for getting onto the charge station with three robots, etc. 
Taya? Can you break down what no scouting is? You've said that a lot, but I'm not sure. What. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah, my bad. So um, we have different types of scouting on our team. Data scouting, as I mentioned, it's part of pre-scouting as well. It involves watching a match and putting information into our scouting app. Note scouting also goes into our scouting app, but it's kind of different. It's about taking qualitative observations about the teams at a competition. So, for example, you'll write down what autos they perform. You'll take quali qualitative observations on their driving capabilities. For example, this robot is fast, but they're very tippy when they place game pieces. Or this robot is easily pinned outside of their loading zone. For example, these are the type of notes that we'll put on a strategy sheet and use to inform decisions. Any other questions? Uh, yeah? Uh, how did your selfish strategy team uh, use the UI to change um, developing the app to um, gather data on a new super tracking? Oh, so that's a little bit out of my range. I'm not software. We have a team of students who do the scouting app, and I can direct you to some of them. Um, I know that because, so basically, how our scouting app works is I can pull it up later if you want to look at it, but you select what game piece they picked up. So there's this pickup option, and you select cone or cube, or undo if uh, they uh, like dropped it or anything. And then it takes you to another screen. After you select that, it takes you to a screen where it says pickup option, high, mid, low, or dropped. And recently, after they added the supercharge, we just have another bar for supercharge, because they all account to the same point value, regardless of their uh, level. So instead of clicking high, mid, low, you just click supercharge. Doesn't matter where it goes on the grid. Other questions? Yeah? Since the drive team does not have a full match strategy, how do you ensure that um, like your drive team does not run into another team's robot that is on your alliance that is doing their part of strategy? Basically, that's the entire point of strategy. That's why we have strategy sheets. That's why we have the uh, maps of the field. We draw out the paths, the paths that every single robot is going to take. So for example, if we go back to here, I'll say, Let's say this is 971 and this is some random team, team zero. Let's say that we're going to be scoring the co-op grid and they're going to be scoring this grid. We'll draw out the exact path that we're going to take and we should never interfere. And while our drive team doesn't know this, our drive coach knows the entire strategy. So his job is to communicate with other teams. Our driver should never be like talking or distracted during a match, but our drive coach will communicate with other teams. And if anything else happens, of course, we're flexible. We can discuss with the other teams, but this should all be figured out before the match begins and we decide exactly where every team is going. Yeah, we also did a lot of practicing of different paths. So when we go to drive practice, you know, we'll practice Scoring on the right side, scoring in the middle, scoring on the left. Okay, you're going to do every single one coming over on the right side. Now you're going to do every single one going over the charge station. Now you're going to do everyone going over to the left. Now we're going to go the opposite direction, and you're going to do it in reverse um, and filling up the whole grid multiple times with different padding options. And then we've also practiced with other teams, so they're used to being like, oh, you're going to score on the right side coming in on the right. Now you're going to go score on the left coming on the left, and we're going to coordinate with the other teams, so they're going to switch sides. So. We did a lot of practicing, so we have different padding options. Yeah. And Already in muscle memory. Yeah, muscle memory, like I discussed with just repeating drills at dry practice over and over again. But it's also, a lot of it does rely on communication in match, but that communication can kind of be regulated before a match begins. So, for example, if we're going to be flopping sides, because for example, let's say we set up our auto over here, but this is our, this is our main grid, and another team can't score high let's say, so they can't complete this link at the top because we do score one game piece up here, then we need to flop at some point. And so we can decide which drive coach is going to make the call on that. And we can decide who's going to call. We need to flip. And then that can be part of the communication. But it's already expected, so it's not a surprise. Yeah. Anything else? <laughs> I um, how does the interaction with the drive team work? Like, does the drive <laughs> coach talk to them? Or like, what information do they get? <laughs> This is our manipulator. So, <laughs> so basically, as strategy lead, I never talk to drive team. The strategy lead does not talk to drive team. No students are allowed to give feedback on driving to drive team besides the drive coach or besides a mentor that they go through and approve the message. 
So um, strategy lead will hand this strategy sheet and run through the entire thing with the drive coach. Then we'll go back to the alliances if we need to make any changes, and we'll just discuss, make sure we're completely clear. And generally, our drive coach will also run over it with the other teams during the queue to make sure that we're all on the same page. And then as the match is about to start, he'll kind of explain part of the strategy, just what we're doing to our drive team. It's not a lot of uh, preparation, if that makes sense, because we don't want the drive team to be overthinking it too much. We just want them to know we're going to be scoring high first, then mid. We're going over here. And the drive coach will make the calls during the match, too. Just We only need to know what we're doing, really. We don't need to know if a defense spot is expected to be placed on us, because that just causes unnecessary stress. All right. Yeah? You mentioned that uh, pick list meetings uh, generally take a long time. You think it's yeah. a few hours. And <laughs> is that, I'm wondering if you had any ideas for how to like uh, make, make them shorter. So <laughs> this was definitely an issue. We've stayed up very late at night. Um, recently, this past season, we found that having a smaller group of students attend definitely helps. And kind of making sure that we do preparation beforehand, like I said, determining the qualities that we need in an alliance partner, that helps so we don't go in blind. We're not just randomly looking at, this robot has good driving, but this robot can score really quickly. We need to determine a rank list of what qualities are most important to us. Having a smaller group of students also means that there are less competing opinions. Um, we still uh, focus on getting opinions from everyone on the team, still having debriefs together as a scouting team, but not every single person on the team needs to go to the pick list meeting because that just makes it take way too long. And Tay's are uh, currently one of our co uh, captains of the team, so she gave a uh, talk about uh, competition strategies, which definitely relates a lot to strategic planning. So feel free to talk to any of us if you're curious. And thank you so much for coming to Spartan Series. This would not be possible without all of you guys. You're all amazing. Thank you for coming down here. Have a great day.